So in the last video, I mentioned that in order to settle our disputes with Spain, Washington sent Thomas Pinckney of South Carolina to negotiate the treaty. And under this treaty, the U.S. gained rights of deposit to New Orleans. Now, we discussed this in Chapter 7, in that uh, we were be being denied the rights of deposit. And what that meant was that manufacturers in the states could drop all of their uh, goods at a port, and then the goods would be held there until the buyers came and picked it up. Uh, and and Spain was denying us that right of using New Orleans, and that was a very important port for us because of all the products that could um, be picked up or could be produced in the southern states. Everybody who had moved west, they could use the Mississippi River, ship it all down to New Orleans, and then it could go right out to sea. And that was the easiest way, even from there, for them to ship goods to other states that were on the East Coast. So New Orleans was very, very important. So this getting us the rights of deposit was a big win for us. And in exchange, uh, the, the United States recognized that the 31st parallel would be the southern boundary. That would be the end of Georgia and the beginning of Florida. And, uh, and, and th thus the, the American people were happy with the way that ended. Okay, so now we're going on to Roman numeral number three, which is the continuation of government. After two terms or eight years, Washington voluntarily steps away from office, even though people had begged him to stay for life. They were ready to recognize him as the king of America, and he knew the pitfalls. He recognized it. He had the wisdom to say, you know what, that's not what I want, and that's not why we broke away from England. And so he willingly stepped away from the office after eight years. On September 19th of 1796, Washington had his farewell printed uh, in the newspaper. Again, we are always used to having things online. So you figure that by the time everyone figured out that he was not going to be running, he was only about two months away from the presidential election. And so it was kind of a shock to everyone that he was not uh, going to stay on for a third term. In his farewell, he made several uh, fatherly, um, he gave several fatherly pieces of advice uh, to the country. Uh, first off, he warned about getting into the disputes that would divide the country. And this is a forewarning. This is something he already could tell on the horizon because of the issue of slavery. Now, he himself was a slave owner. He had owned slaves. And he could see the country dividing, uh, even at that point, over the issue of slavery. Uh, the th next thing he did was he encouraged that there be good relations with foreign countries. And that included Great Britain. He knew that there was no way we would be able to survive on the world stage if we were not friends with Britain. And he knew that to have the three powerhouse countries, Spain, France, and Great Britain, on our side, or at least in good relations, that would do nothing but make us stronger financially as well as diplomatically. He also encouraged that the, the policy of neutrality be followed. And as I mentioned to you in the last video, uh, this um, policy of neutrality um, fostered the isolationism that America would practice all the way up into World War II. Um, if you look at history, we do not get involved when uh, World War I happened. Uh, the world was asking the U.S. to get involved, but we did not until the Lusitania was um, bombed and American lives were lost. We did not get involved in World War II until Pearl Harbor. And once again, a direct attack on American soil, and we, um, and we will respond. But up to that, we were not. Even though we knew that bad things were happening in Europe, we knew that the concentration camps were killing people, we were not getting involved until it directly affected American people. Um, so I, Washington does die two years after retirement. Um, he dies because of a couple of factors. First off, he had a throat infection. And as part of throat infection, um, when he sought medical treatment, they did a practice of called bleeding. They believe that when you had a fever or you were sick, it was because the humors in your blood were out of sync, that they were not level. 
And so by practicing this po policy or uh, this, by doing this bleeding, um, they were supposed to be bringing your humors back into check. Well, obviously, now we know um, 200 years later that that's not the reason why we get sick or um, uh, or why we have infections. And But at that time, that was a practice. So between him being an elderly man, he was in his late 60s, uh, and, the pra and then he's also fighting a throat infection, and then they bleed him. He uh, does not have the necessary strength he needs to overcome, and he does pass away. Um, now, as presidents go, there's been no other American has been honored like him. Okay, he is, um, so no other American has been honored like him. Uh, there are more cities, streets, schools, buildings uh, that are named after him than any other president. In fact, there's more about him than there is about uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, Henry Lee, when he eulogized the president, he made uh, a famous quote, which was that George Washington was the first in war, but he was also the first in peace and the first in the hearts of his countrymen. And that aptly did describe George Washington. So now that, um, now we're going to back up, and it's the election of 1796. The country's just received notice that their beloved president is not going to be running for pre uh, president again. And so now you have um, the political parties coming to the forefront. Now we know that during our study of um, chapter seven and the constitution that there were two varying uh, or diametrically opposed political views with regards to the federal government. You had the Federalists who believed in a strong government, and you had the Anti-Federalists who believed in states' rights and that the state governments should be the main power of the, of the country. So in this um, election, you have Thomas Jefferson, and he's being chosen by the Anti-Federalists, but the Anti-Federalists have chosen a new name, and they've renamed themselves the Democratic Republicans. And, but he is hands down the favorite for that party. The Federalists, however, are torn between um, Thomas Pinckney, who had just signed the very popular treaty with Spain, and John Adams, who was the vice president, and again, very uh, popular because he helped George Washington. And, and the results of the election are that John Adams, now I should back up and say that in these elections you did not have popular uh, the people actually doing a popular vote. The whole reason that the Electoral College was created was that it would not allow for a popular vote. Popular vote does not come in until later. So in the Electoral College, there was only uh, sheets of paper with people's names on it, and the first person who got the majority became president, and the second person got to be vice president. And so it did allow for two men to have to work together who came from two opposite political parties. And that's exactly what happened. John Adams from the Federalists took the presidency and Thomas Jefferson from the Dem Democratic Republicans became vice president. Now, unfortunately for John Adams, he had to live in Washington's shadow. And that has happened a couple of other times. You have Andrew Johnson who had to live in the shadow of Abraham Lincoln and he was so despised and disliked that they act, that they actually uh, impeached him. However, they did not convict him. Another president that lived in a uh, in his predecessor's shadow was George H. W. Bush, the the uh, father, um, and he was vice president to Ronald Reagan. Well, Ronald Reagan. Uh, Ronald Reagan's presidency is probably considered to be one of the best presidencies in modern times. Um, many people equate, um, conservatives I should say, would, would equate Donald Trump's presidency to be very, very similar to Ronald Reagan's. And when your predecessor is so powerful and so liked, you can't, um, you're, you're not going to escape the... Um, comparison. People are going to compare you all the time to what they would have decided over what he decided. And that's exactly what 
happened to John Adams. Now, John Adams didn't come to the office unprepared. He actually had a very long-standing career, which made him very qualified to serve as president. He had been an ambassador and an emissary for the U.S. government. He had sat in on the con Continental Congresses. Um, he had even served as a lawyer in Massachusetts. Um, okay, so... <clears throat> Um, Adams had to try and conduct his own presidency in the shadow of having all of his actions and his decisions compared to Washington. Adams was not um, a military man. Uh, he was actually kind of short and uh, he tried to come across with the same bravado that Washington did, you know, looking so put together in his continental uniform with a sword at his side. And Adams tried to emulate that, but he looked a little silly. Uh, and he was also from uh, the North. He was from New England. And um, I know you haven't been in the States very long, Howard. And obviously, I know you don't go out very much uh, for quarantining. But if you ever get a chance to travel our states, you'll notice a distinct difference. The further north you go, I'm not saying that people are unfriendly, but they, they have a certain distance that they keep from everyone. And they're not very engaging, uh, and they're aloof. Now, I, I'm sure that if you got to know them or if you moved into their town, they would be absolutely lovely, love, um, lovely people. However, if you go south, if you go to states like West Virginia and South Carolina and Alabama, those people are effusive in their joy to see you. You may have, they may not know you from anyone for, at all, and but they'll be excited to see you, and you don't know why. Um, people always smile at you and hold doors, and anybody who lives in the United States will always tell you that people who live south always seem to be so much more friendly than those who live in the North. So it wasn't that John Adams was not friendly. He actually was, but he was reserved, and he was a little bit of an introvert. So he was not the charismatic military leader who knew how to have conversation with, you know, multiple men in a room. Um, he, uh, he did not carry himself well. So because of his just bookishness and his reserved, his reserved uh, demeanor, people actually did not like him. They thought that he was kind of cold and distant, and that was not the truth. But unfortunately, sometimes, first, as they say, first impressions are lasting impressions, and many people, um, just by getting that cold feel from him, had no use. Now, one of... The problems that Adam had was that he did not replace um, he did not replace Washington's cabinet. He kept all of his same advisors. So Henry Knox, being the you know the um, the uh, Secretary of Defense or Secretary of the Military, and Andrew Hamilton, the Secretary of the Treasury, um, whoever George Washington had replaced uh, Thomas Jefferson with, as far as Secretary of State. They were all the people who had worked for Washington. And so therefore, uh, they, again, they wanted Adams to be Washington. And when he was not that way, um, when he did not have the decisiveness of a military leader, they, they criticized him. And then they would talk about their criticisms to his political enemies, which would have been in the Democratic Republican Party. And so between uh, the you know, his, his close co-workers of the cabinet and uh, then his political enemies, the public opinion turned against him. And, you know, and he therefore couldn't do anything right. Like right now, if you were to talk to a conservative versus a liberal, a conservative is not happy with the things that Joe Biden is doing. Uh, they don't, they don't appreciate the, any of his, uh, where he, where his vision is for the country. And, um, and so you will, you know, you'll see something, um, very, very different than if you talk to a liberal who loves Joe Biden and they think he's doing everything right by the country. So 
It didn't matter how he handled the situation. It just was not going to come out well for him. 